it's not uh, Lee Anderson who's important as an individual uh, so much as the underlying and potentially seismic shifts that are taking place beneath him within the within the Conservative Party. I mean, nobody would think that Lee Anderson is a sort of big figure or an important figure in British uh, politics. But what he's doing is voicing and representing a uh, growth of sort of frac- factions, a realignment that's taking place in the Conservative Party. <laughs> How to Win an Election, episode 20. Well done, everyone. We've made it to 20 episodes. Uh, still joined by new Labour mastermind, Peter Manson. Policy McKenzie is Policy McKenzie, former director of policy for Nick Clegg and Tory Brainbox, Daniel Finkelstein. If you want to get in touch, email us win at thetimes.co.uk or you can WhatsApp 0333 003 2353. Send us your views and questions. Uh, send us a voice note, 0333 003 2353. I've realised... Something very important has happened, which is I've become completely acclimatised to the theme music. Just as I was listening to it, I thought I've completely almost don't notice it anymore. Mm. Mm. If you do, you, do you now like it? You just want to put it out <laughs> of your like mind, Danny. <laughs> it's a it's a classic post traumatic stress response, Danny. <laughs> You've just just tuned out. Just tuned out. That uh, was good. Uh, uh, now we need to talk about Peter. Only a couple of weeks. No, ago. no, 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 no. You no, said, we're not going back to that. You said you wanted to go viral. Uh, no, I don't want to go viral anymore. <laughs> um, I've, I've been there, done that, and I've got the T-shirt. But you know, I'm afraid that my uh, fat shaming faux pas was not my only faux pas last week. What? No, there was another one. Um, I when we were discussing budgets, and I was contrasting the very sort of principled, high-minded Roy Jenkins with a rather more irresponsible Norman Lamont in 1992. I said that he'd cut income tax by 2p uh, as an election-winning giveaway and he promptly pointed out to me that it was not a 2p tax cut. He introduced a rather progressive (laughs) new 20p tax ban and it was that, of course, which so discombobulated the Labour Party. So, sorry, Norman. Sorry to Norman. And, and, and well, on the subject of budget, should we, should we hear what Jeremy Hunt said during the budget last week? I know he's been taking advice from Lord Mandelson, who yesterday rather uncharitably <laughs> said he needed to shed a few pounds. <laughs> Ordinary families will shed more than a few pounds if that lot get in. God, that's hilarious. <laughs> It's actually I, I really quite a good political joke, actually. And, uh, <laughs> Danny, it's not up to your standard. He, he, was, he looked very pleased with himself, Jeremy Hunt, when he did that joke. Has, has oh, Keir Starmer been in touch? Uh, he sent me a sort of droll little text message uh, on the day. Yes. <laughs> He's he completely unaffected by it. Honestly, he doesn't have a shred of personal vanity in him. But some, one or two people around him just thought that perhaps if things... Uh, dropped into my head, I might think before they came out of my mouth. Right, is that what they were suggesting? I think <laughs> zip it was the <laughs> expression used by one of them. I, I think the point was that, that Peter was trying to be non-partisan. He had listed about 15 fashion faux pas of Rishi's. You know, he was, I was just trying, to, trying balance to be balanced a little but, bit, so, but like also Keir Starmer, you know. With my famous, could... my famous impish sense of humour. If I may, on this, uh, it's actually a classic example of, of what we discuss a lot of the time. So, it doesn't matter at all whether you said that. All that matters is whether you were right, OK? Because you were talking about the impression given by Keir Starmer. The fact that you on a, the fact that you on a podcast, which, you know, obviously we have a, a niche, but big, you know, big niche listenership, but on a podcast said that is irrelevant, uh, except obviously to people who have relationships with you uh, and, and our listeners. But to the general voter, it's irrelevant. Uh, but... What you said, what you said matters. So (laughs) all that matters in this case, and all that the people around him should think about is, is that in fact correct or not? I'm not commenting on whether it is, but it's, but I'm, but I'm commenting on how we analyse things politically. We often talk about should someone have said something. I remember during the '97 election, Brian Mawinney didn't want to circulate the opinion polls, the focus groups, because he was worried that it might leak and then it would become apparent that we were doing quite poorly. And the a point I kept making is that you were leaking back to people what they already thought, <laughs> so it didn't matter. <laughs> anyway, shall we um, draw the veil, move on? <laughs> well, James has been in touch. Uh, so Because the whole point was that in, in, we had lots of people saying, you know, we should be concentrating on principles and not how people look, but how people look does matter in politics. 
And James got in touch says, I was canvassing for the Tories in 97. He was, you probably know him, Danny, one of the handful who were. Uh, he was in a Tory marginal that was likely to go Labour, so the response of the doorsteps were predictable. I knocked on one door to be greeted by a smartly dressed lady in her mid to late 60s. She looked at my blue rosette and before I could even begin my pitch said, I'm sorry, it's no for me. She said it without any malice and almost sadness. I asked her politely why. She said it was down to the choice of ties worn by Mr Major versus those worn by Mr Blair. She said that her late husband has always dressed impeccably, including his choice of tie. She said you could always tell a lot about a man from his choice of ties. Mr Major's ties were inferior to those worn by Mr Blair and was a clear indicator of the respective gentleman's character. So Mr Blair got the vote. Needless to say, the consistency went red in the political tsunami of that year. And who bought Mr Blair's ties? And still hasn't been a paid back. As we learned last <laughs> week, and I still haven't been paid back. <laughs> so there we are. There we are. So but we, you've learnt your lesson. Sorry, my lips are zipped. <laughs> <laughs> no more opinions from Peter. No more opinions from Peter. What will we do? That uh, would be very counterintuitive. Let's, <laughs> let's turn our... Because we're going to talk um, a bit later on the, on the general point of, of defecting and the impact it can have. But let's start with Lee Anderson, former Tory MP. Had the whip the jaw. He's now become a former UK's first MP. How big a problem do you think this is for Rishi Sunak, Polly? Well, it, it, it's only a problem in as much as it catalyses uh, the challenge he already faced. I mean, it was interesting to see uh, Danny Kruger and Miriam Cates. Uh, I, I can't remember precisely what their Tory the group new is conservatives. Called. The new conservatives. It's hard to the popular conservatives. The new. It's hard to keep control of these factions. But it, it, interesting, they sort of put out a, a, a statement saying that they regretted what Lee Anderson had done, but um, that it was all the Tories' fault for not having stood by the sort of low immigration, more reform-leaning policy agenda that they believed was both what uh, was in the 2019 manifesto and also is is more aligned with with their concerns. And, and, and so it's that sense that it, is this a sort of schismatic moment for the Conservatives Will those factions feel aggrieved and angry and 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 be able to sort of collect behind Lee Anderson? I, I he's not the sort of figurehead who is I think going to attract a lot more defections behind him. He doesn't have very, uh, I guess the the demeanour or um, uh, collaborative habits that a leader might uh, might need if he was going to get people to actually join his team. But I, that sense that just sort of. Um, becomes a symbol of a wider problem is is what matters. If he was the only person who felt this way and joined reform, it wouldn't matter at all. I mean, we should point out, he didn't leave the Conservatives to join reform. He was kicked out of the Conservatives. Yes. So he was it's, homeless rather than... Look, it's moving. effect rather than cause. I think Polly's got it right. Um, he, But it does ask, a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a symbol of something quite big. And it's the question of whether the Conservative Party coalition can hold together in particular whether Lee, Lee Anderson obviously has decided he doesn't want that coalition at all, but I think Danny Kruger and Miriam Cates are asking, do I really want to be in the same party as someone like me? Um, and, uh, and my view is um, if they don't have a coalition with someone like me and if I don't have a coalition with someone like them, then uh, you end up having to have coalitions with other people and you have to think who those might be. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they can't, they, they think that they can make it on their own, they simply can't because they're not big enough as a group. They're, they're, they're you know, they're 15%. They're, they're they're not big enough to be uh, a force. So um, I, I thought, I think it's potentially is quite a big moment. I think parts of the Conservative Party are definitely asking whether they belong together. And, uh, you know, in Lee Anderson's case, when he said that about uh, Islamism, uh, though I don't have a problem with attacking Islamism, I do have a problem with attacking a, you know, routine um, Muslim-like uh, Sadiq Khan, as if he was therefore responsible for all Islamism. I think that is wrong, and I don't... And I'm glad that he was that the whip was suspended by him. And I'm not surprised that he then thinks he can't continue in the same political party as me. But at some point, this tension, um, which this is an effect of, I think is extremely significant for Conservatives. I agree with Danny. I mean, it's not uh, Lee Anderson who's important as an individual uh, so much as the underlying and potentially seismic shifts that are taking place beneath him within the within the Conservative Party. I mean, nobody would think that Lee Anderson is a sort of big 
figure or an important figure in British uh, politics. But what he's doing is voicing and representing a uh, growth of sort of frac factions, a realignment that's taking place in the Conservative Party. So whilst he isn't important, uh, uh, he, the consequences of Lee Anderson might be important. The repercussions uh, could be because the, the Conservative Party at the moment is a bit of a powder keg. Uh, it's very combustible and somebody might just produce another spark and the whole thing goes up in flames before or after the election. But remember, of course, that Lee Anderson started in the Labour Party mm. uh, and, and and he represents a certain kind of, uh, I guess, working class communitarianism that, that has some roots on the left as well as on the right, that, that rejects... Um, uh, I, I get rejects liberalism, rejects uh, globalization, rejects uh, so much of of what was, I guess, a consensus between the Blair so, so, era and the so Cameron much of era. What Rishi Sunak represents well, himself. Except, <laughs> Rishi Sunak doesn't, of course, really know what he represents because he also is in favour of free freewheeling market capitalism, as, as well as communitarianism and and sort of uh, you know no to foreigners, and 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 so he's also uh, Lee Anderson, a sort of a symbol of that that Brexit coalition, which did bridge left and right uh, and was in defiance of a liberal consensus or a neoliberal consensus, whether you whether you like it or not. Um, and, I, and I guess that, that that group was brought together much more coherently in 2019 under Boris Johnson and is now finding a home... That, that home in the Conservative Party just doesn't really work for yeah. it. Can, I, just, people can, like can I disagree with one... Point though, uh, yeah. which when you said that Rishi Sunak, um, but you know, believes in kind of no to foreigners. Actually, uh, having a, a, a migration policy in this country isn't saying no to foreigners, right? We have we have to have a migration policy of some kind. What the problem is, Rishi Sunak hasn't been able to make one that's workable because our international uh, system of law. Uh, is that I think makes it extremely difficult for any country to control migration and eventually we're going to have to visit that, revisit that and have some sort of sensible system that reflects what public opinion wants to some extent. Um, and that is so my view is that his position on that those issues, though he hasn't been able to affect any of those, is relatively moderate. The problem that he's, is he's got someone like Lee Anderson who then expresses it in a way that he simply can't stand by because he is actually, as you said, basically um, a... a a sort of free market liberal conservative. Um, so, so the, the, I mean, the, one of the problems with Lee Anderson's position, as reflected by the fact that he's moved across all these p political parties, is that it's a mess of different positions. Richard Tice, the leader of the Reform Party the other day, attacked Big Pharma in his... Uh, in his in a tweet. And PH. I thought to myself, at the same... PH, not PH. F. PH, not F. Pharma. Yes, yes, yes. Pharmaceuticals, not yeah, pharma Just um, because, you know, big pharma with an F is, is a big deal too. Thank you for pointing that out, because there obviously were many, many people who didn't, who didn't realise that. That's, who da Danny could have gone me. viral with it. <laughs> <laughs> the big bit, Peter, yeah, rather yeah, than yeah. the pharma. But the, uh, the, um, the big... And the, yet at the same time, the, uh, the Reform Party accuses the Conservative Party being virtually socialist because it increases corporation tax, right? Meanwhile, thinking that the pharmaceutical industry is trying to is engaged in a massive conspiracy to poison people. So it is a, a sort of mess of incoherent political positions, in my view, to which to which which reform represents, and it's extremely difficult for any political party trying to create anything other than a kind of um, appeal of slogans. Um, you know, a proper program to actually to actually get get round this political idea, and uh, and that makes it extremely difficult to coalesce with, to be honest. But the problem that, that there are lots of contradictions of what Lee Anderson says, and I don't think anyone would say he's a great political philosopher or that everything he thinks hangs together. The problem is that Rishi Sunak made him deputy chair of the Conservative Party. Oh, yeah, I agree. He gave him the platform from which to to do all of this because he represent. I mean, that that this was. I thought it was misconceived at the time, uh, and clearly it's shown to be that because because Lee Anderson didn't want to treat with him, right? Wasn't willing to make the compromises to do that. But what Rishi Sunak thinks, and he's not wrong, is that if the Conservative Party ends up splitting between that wing, the Danny Kruger and Miriam Kate's wing, and his, um, it will split its vote in half, you know, which it probably will. Danny, can I ask you a question? 
the, the, the great defection of the Labour Party um, decades ago was the SDP, the Social Democrats, so we can come back and discuss that if you want. But that was moderate uh, leaders, MPs from the Labour Party, deserting the Labour Party because it was being taken over by the hard left. In this case, it's the hard right who are leaving, they're defecting. Why do you not say good riddance to bad rubbish? Why don't you say, we, you know, let them go? Let them, if, if their natural home is in Reform UK and they can just luxuriate in that sort of Farageist sort of mixture of, you know, hard right policies, and then people like you can get on with reconstructing the Conservative yeah, I, Party into a, a popularly appealing centrist, mainstream, centre right yes, party. I, I certainly think that um, Lee Anderson's less of a, a loss than David Gork. Uh, so that is my basic view. I, you know, I don't, I don't wake, I didn't wake up in the morning desperate that Regretting. I no longer was in the same political but it, party. But that's also basically what David, t a decade ago was what David Cameron did. He, you know, he dismissed UKIP as racist and fruitcakes and and all of that, and and said, you know, this is a, we are a different party. And if you want to go off to the joy of them, you carry on. I mean, ultimately. Some of them then did, and it slightly derailed him. But... but And then also Boris Johnson came along and chopped off another bit of the party, so they're not welcome. And, you know, if, if, as Danny says, right, a, a party is a coalition of different groups of people. Eventually, if you keep chopping limbs off, you're like, um, you know, the knights who say neat. Yeah. Uh, and you're just a torso. And but... you can't win an election if you're a bleeding torso. There does have to be a... <laughs> there does have to be on that immortal... <laughs> Observation. Um, there does have to be a reckoning in the Conservative Party, though, doesn't there? I mean, there was. We had a reckoning in the eighties over the STP. We had a reckoning big time over Corbyn uh, much later on. Doesn't there, Danny, have to be a reckoning uh, where all this is yes. brought to a head and this sort of schism is is I dealt think... with? I mean, what would happen? Unlikely, it seems, according to the polls, if the Conservatives win the next general election. But supposing they do, that reckoning would take place on the other side of the election I, I when the Conservatives were being re-elected, should it happen, uh, to run the country. I agree. Look, uh, go I, up I, in I do, flames. I think that I think that it is a bit demographically different. The gr the the uh, the group represented by people like Lee Anderson. Um, I think is is quite substantially larger than the group represented by the far left in the Labour Party, uh, and also has much more m mainstream appeal, um, and and a, and a bigger demographic base in the country. So I do, I think it is slightly more difficult uh, to deal with. And the Conservative Party has always been a coalition that has included those people, and it will be substantially weaker without it in terms of size, but it will not be as weaker in terms of coherence, unity and ideology. Um, and so clearly I think the, the right route for the Conservative Party is to tack towards the centre and I think that ultimately you get less defections if you do that. Uh, so that is obviously what I think is the right thing to do. But it's not, I don't think the analogy with the Labour Party is as simple as that. It's not as easy as that. Plus the fact the moment you're doing it is a moment when you're already, uh, you know, in office but reeling uh, and that's the, a difficult moment to do it. The reality is those reckonings only come when you have lost <laughs> and and there are people in the Conservative Party who are quite keen for the party to get on and lose so that it can start to think <laughs> in that way and I think actually in 2010 Peter was of, of a view that essentially Labour needed to spend some time out of power in order to rethink. Not sure about that but well. we, we can... <laughs> We, That's we, how it feels. We, feel we can address that essay, que essay question on the other day. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a reckoning coming. Uh, uh, Carl's been in touch saying, isn't Jeremy Clarkson the leader of Big Pharma? So thank you for that, Carl. <laughs> uh, right, uh, no, coming... he's Small Pharma. <laughs> Come on, Big Pharma. Whatever. Big, big Pharma is like the Duke of Hoojimaflop. I think it's a Mandelsonian joke about his size. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Draw the veil. This is, this is How to Win an Election, brought to you by Weight Watchers. Uh, right, up next, we're going to take a look at defection. What uh, defections from the past tell us? Everyone's brought in their favourite defections. Now, we've been talking about defections. We've talked about Lee Anderson and all of that. But let's take a trip down memory lane uh, for a few defections of the past. It is the biggest break in the pattern of British politics for at least 60 years. As of today, I have put my political career in jeopardy for one very simple reason. The Tory party of today is extremist. Uh, I don't belong in the Conservative Party. Uh, I do belong in the Labour Party. I believe in what they're trying to do. I'm today leaving the Conservative Party and joining UKIP. We have all now resigned from the Labour Party. 
This has been a very difficult, painful, but necessary decision. Can I start by warmly welcoming the Honourable Member for Bury South to yeah. his new place? So, go on then, who can name all of those? Uh, oh, Christian Roy, Wakefield. Christian Roy, Wakefield was the last Roy, one. Roy, Roy Jenkins was the first one. Roy Jenkins was the first one. Change UK. Change UK, very good. Oh, Luciana mm. Berger. That was um, that guy with the square jaw, Douglas Carswell. Very good. So um, Danny. Oh Is, isn't the feature Alan of Alan Howarth? Jaw that it's uh, not Alan no, Howarth no, Sean Woodward. Sean Woodward. Sean Woodward, yeah, very good. Sean Woodward was the second one. One more in the middle. The Labour defecting to the Tories. Oh, sorry, Quentin Davis, that one. Quentin yeah. Davis, very good. Oh, I make that four four to Danny, one to Polly, one to Peter. That brings us to the end of that <laughs> section. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's talk then about where it has had an impact. Have any of those changed the political weather? Quentin Davis always struck me as the weirdest one because he defected from the Tories just as the Tories were on course to win an election, Peter. Um, it was something to launch Gordon Brown's premiership. Mm. And Quentin uh, kindly obliged, and he went to the House of Lords subsequently for his pains and was a very, very good member of the House of Lords, late Quentin Davis. But he, it was a little cameo appearance that he made to launch Gordon's <laughs> premiership. I actually met Quentin at a Labour Party conference shortly afterwards and he came up and it was rather sweet. He sort of said, I don't really know anybody here and I, do you mind if we have a drink together? <laughs> and I was, because I was like, <laughs> the only Conservative he could find. Uh, it was mm -hmm. sort of, it showed that culturally, and it was, a, it was always culturally a bit odd in, for him in the Labour Party, I think. I, I think it's, it's so weird for people who have defected because, you know, you might spend 20, 30 years in a political party. You kind of grow up there. You've got your friends and the people you stayed up late with at 25 and the people you worked with. And then suddenly you're in a, a new party where all of those established networks exclude you. And Luciana Berger, who we heard in the end, ended up in the Lib Dems, though she's gone back to Labour now. As did Chuko Muna. Uh, mm. Yes, I, I ran into Luciana at a Lib Dem conference and and it was really interesting because she just looked sort of quite lost and bemused. Yeah. But of course, when you have defected, it's it's such a like boost to the people whose party you've joined. You're sort of a celebrity. Mm. And so she had all of these little fanboys and fangirls kind of coming up and wanting to shake her hand. Mm. And they're not really have anything to say to her. Um, so because, because she doesn't know the words to, to glee. Exactly. Was, was a sort of Tory. With, I mean, he was Tory Jock McTory, the winner of the Mr Tory competition. <laughs> <laughs> he had these kind of very thick pinstripe suits. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, and it was just quite funny. He was just sort of. Uh, there was another like that, Peter Temple Morris, uh, who oh, defected yes. from the Conservatives right, in 1997. Uh, he became an independent one nation Tory and then he came straight across to Labour and he too went to the House of Lords, played a very valuable role amongst Labour peers. I mean, there is a risk that you're not just hated by the party you leave, but you're not embraced by the party you defect to. But we always made sure that the welcome mat was well rolled out for people. And I, Alan Howarth, as I mentioned before, came before Peter Temple Morris and he went on to become a very successful arts minister, but, uh, some, as well as a member of the House of Lords. <laughs> and Reg Prentice, I mean, sometimes people do manage to make bring this up. And Reg Prentice is obviously a minister in Labour, in, uh, in Labour, and then became a Tory minister and he managed to acclimatise so it can and of course I mean Sean Woodward rose quite high mm. actually these people do think that it is about themselves of course and there's a great fantango when they actually make the move and it's very exciting for them and they're celebrities for five minutes but what is important as I was saying before is what's going on below the surface it's this ructions and tech tonic plates that are shifting uh, which uh, had the real uh, meaning and that of course was what was behind the STP split in uh, 1981 uh, what was going on in the Labour Party was bordering on revolutionary I mean the hard left led by Tony Benn and others were literally taking the Labour Party by storm moderate Labour MPs were being uh, threatened with deselection uh, some were um, Dick Tavern in Lincoln uh, was was deselected. He stood as an independent, as an, as an MP, um, 
uh, I'm not sure whether Rage Prentice stood again or, or not. I think no, possibly he moved, he moved seats, stood again, became the disability minister in the Tory government. Yeah. So that so that 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 was a success. Um, I I mean, what... so, so in a way, there's like there's two types of defection. There's the one where it tells us something about what's going on in that political party, whether it's unhappy with the direction of the Labour Party or the SDP or the direction of the Labour Party. Yes. Under, or there's essentially the sort of self-interest stunt one where you can see which party's on the up and then you you, you take the leap. Yeah, but you, of course, oh, the party only wants those people if it is symbolising something, you yeah. know, that, a sense that it symbolises the fact that the party's on the up, uh, which it absolutely did in the run-up to the 97 election. I, I guess some listeners might be a bit queasy about this trading of political favours, including a seat in our legislature of the House of Lords for the rest of your life for one quick political press conference. Um, uh, it strikes me that it's not the best way for us to decide yeah, how I, the country is governed, but nevertheless, I, I our politics voters, is full of such I stupid think games. I think voters are very happy to be fickle themselves, but they're less impressed by fickle politicians. <laughs> They don't know who any of them are. They don't know it at all. But the um, but <laughs> so, but 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 I do think I'm a bit more sympathetic to it. So let's take for example Sean Woodward. He was clearly an issue about the liberalism of the Conservative Party, the position on gay rights, which he made centre stage. He didn't want to vote on that. The position the Conservative Party had got itself into. In Quentin Davis, it was really about Europe, and actually rather before its time, actually to see where the Conservative Party was going on that issue. Um, so I'm a bit more respectful of it. I think that's, I think often, you know, and Luciana was obviously pushed out of the Labour Party, uh, pretty much. And and quite often these people end up, certainly they have to, they, they, they end up sometimes having to move seats, sometimes losing the seats. You know, mm -hmm. well, like I, one of my political heroes is Mike Thomas in Newcastle, the Member of Parliament. I think he's a, a brilliantly intelligent guy with a long, long political future, very creative, founder of the House magazine, uh, you know, a really good political organiser ahead of his time in terms of he did the SDP launch. And Mike essentially sacrificed his political career. He couldn't win in Newcastle as an SDP MP in the 83 election. Um, for the principle that he wouldn't stand for what the Labour Party stood for in 1983. And I, I could not be more respectful, so he's one of my heroes. But, but mm. the, the point is that there are a group of people who have in exactly the way you described, either because they are moving to a smaller party or to a party that's losing power, sacrifice their political careers for principle. Um, uh, but there are others who have done the opposite, who have managed to secure themselves a lifelong tenure... <laughs> Uh, and a stipend in the House of Lords by doing so. And and whilst you might even then be very respectful of the political symbolism of those choices and the values that motivate them, there, there nevertheless is something a bit weird about it, isn't there? It's usually a bit. I, I mean, I do remember George Osborne saying to me about somebody uh, defecting and then getting an office. He said, even Philby got a flat in Moscow. Um, and, um, <laughs> and I, 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 you know, so there is definitely, in politics, there's always a mixture a personal calculation and political principle, and it's not always easy to disentangle them. Mm. But in each case, you can see why people left for concrete reasons. And of course, you know, they did end up advancing themselves, and um, that was true of Alan Howth, whom I respected a lot. Um, it was true of Quentin Davis, um, and you know, it was true of Sean Woodward, actually. In each case, uh, despite the fact they defected from something I was involved in, I, I saw the principal involved in it, even though they also, also benefited from it. So how did you get on going from the SDP to the Conservatives? Were you hanging yeah. around, well, not knowing point, anyone yeah. awkwardly, no, like yeah. you were starting at a new <laughs> I mean, school? Where were you before It the was SDP? a political... In, I was in the Labour Party. So when I was 16, so I, I managed to uh, cover the whole ground. You're worse than so Lee Anderson. When I was... I am. <laughs> so I'm not that critical of it. I, I think I think my political position has been broadly similar. Uh, I have moved a bit more to the right. I'm more free market orientated than I was in my teens. But I, but I, my um, view in in was that that move to the SDP was made essential by the position the Labour Party had. Um, and then and then the SDP then crumbled. Otherwise, I'd still probably it be a member away of away from you. Yeah, yeah it, it crumbled <laughs> and, it, and it disappeared. So uh, then I had to make a choice. Moving from the centre-left to the centre-right was the bigger 
was definitely the bigger choice. Uh, and, f and from, you know, most of the time I haven't regretted that. I think that actually is where my poll, sometimes big issues come up, like strikes and everything. I think, yeah, I, think I can see exactly why I chose that side of the divide. But you are choosing your allies. So you are basically choosing, do I want to be in a political mm -hmm. party with Diane Abbott and Jeremy Corbyn? Do I want to be in a political party that has Lee Anderson in it? You're making that choice. Um, which, wh who's got the upper hand? Wh who, where would I be more comfortable? Um, the big issues for me, there was a big strike at the office where I worked. I didn't want to join it. I ended up being fun fined by the NUJ. Um, and I thought, I'm finished with the left. And I, I've never really regretted that. I couldn't move uh, from the Labour Party in the early 1980s. I was just biologically tied uh, to it. I had that umbilical cord and... When many of my friends were going to the SDP, I just thought, oh, shall I, shan't I? But then I thought, well, I have to look my mother in the eyes and she wouldn't like it at all. But I had very good friends, political allies, who went to the SDP, one in particular, um, a guy called Roger Little, who I was very close to a neighbour of. He had been Bill Rogers' special advisor in government and he went to the SDP. I mean, a more loyal, deep-rooted Labour man you couldn't imagine. I then faced him a few years later in the 1986 Fulham by-election when he was standing for the SDP and I was running the campaign for Labour against him, which denied him a seat in the Commons. I'm pleased to say that uh, in the early 1990s he came back to Labour, became a great aide and supporter uh, of New Labour, went to work for Tony Blair in number uh, 10 and is now a very effective member of the front bench in the House of uh, oh, Lords. Everyone ends up at the House of Lords. Yeah. Well, well, they're good people, actually. <laughs> you and me, Matt. Not Polly, you and me. Not you and me. Only about a time. Now, Polly, you went from the Lib Dems to then setting up the Women's Equality Party. So did you... Were you then shunned by your Lib Dem, old Lib Dem colleagues? No, I don't think anyone really noticed. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I started working for the Lib Dems uh, before I joined them, I, I was um, just sort of interested in, in policy, politics, policy, po po policy, politics. Uh, wanted to get some experience in Parliament. I, I'd applied for a job with uh, a Tory MP, actually, Geoffrey Clifton Brown, mm. um, who did not offer me a job. And then Ed Davey uh, did offer me a job. So I went to work for him. But um, a sliding doors moment that was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, but then, you know, you it's easy to get sucked into uh what Peter describes as biological, but feels very tribal, that sense of a sense of belonging, of being uh, mm. being right and being around people who believe in things and who believe in things with you. And so from a kind of more nonpartisan uh, perspective, I, I I spent then uh, more than ten years in the Liberal Democrats. But I, I remember during the 2015 general election hearing Sandy Toxvig on the radio talking about a different way of doing politics, about uh, setting up the Women's Equality Party. And I, I, I was inspired by the idea which they had of a nonpartisan political party. Because if I'm biologically anything, it's actually nonpartisan. I find that yeah. the, the way tribalism corrupts people's judgment to be profoundly upsetting, really. And, and the idea of making feminism into more of a hygiene factor that was campaigning within all of the political parties, which was the idea that Sandy and, and her co-founder Catherine Mayer had had, was really exciting and interesting. It, it hasn't worked in the way that they conceived, I think, at the time, but it is still an important, the an important force. The reason force. why these things don't work, Polly, and let's bear this in mind, it's not a question of... It's the tri tri again. Well, it's not <laughs> tribalism and it's not sentiment... Um, uh, and it's not biology. It, it's the electoral system. Uh, the yeah, but reason, we should change the that. reason why the STP uh, failed in the end, I mean, it failed for two reasons. One is that Tony Benn failed by a whisker to topple uh, Dennis Healy as deputy leader of the Labour Party. If, he, if Benn had won, then you'd have seen a m massive seismic shift uh, from uh, Labour uh, to sort of reverse engineer into the STP, I think. And that would have been the end of the Labour Party uh, as we know it. But in the 83 election, the SDP was virtually neck and neck in share of the vote. Labour was only uh, just ahead of the SDP, but the SDP got 13 seats because of first past the post and Labour got something in the region of 150. Yeah. That gave the Labour Party its chance to breathe uh, again and to fight back and, of course, came back in the 87 yes, election. SDP Liberal Alliance, which I don't make as a small point. I mean, it was important. Um, the SDP couldn't survive, to, couldn't have fought as by itself. Um, and uh, what happened was that the SDP really was a party aimed at 
southern middle class people fighting northern working class seats. Um, and that's and that I think was the problem demographically. So it wasn't able to concentrate itself. So the alliance was both essential and also ultimately destructive. Uh, and the the electoral system is clearly is mm. the issue. And so you say it would have brought the Labour Party to an end as we know it. And there's and I talked earlier about this division in the Conservative Party. In the end, the system mandates a two-party system, just like in Canada. So in Canada, they went round in a big circle, created a reform party. The Conservative Party ended up with two seats. And within a couple of elections, within 10 to 15 years, they would they created the Conservative yeah, Party yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, David's been in touch with his favourite uh, defector, Andrew Hunter, uh, who, <laughs> for a while, uh, he was a Conservative, and then he became the DUP member for Basingstoke, I didn't realise that. Yeah. What about uh, John Stonehouse? We didn't talk about him. <laughs> and he, 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 because he became that was a member. A little bit more than a defection. <laughs> <laughs> he, became, he became the only MP of the English National Party. <laughs> H- having defected to Australia. <laughs> and then, of course, there's Churchill who defected. Oh, Ch- twice. Churchill all the time, which is what everyone talks cool. to. Yeah, do Churchill all the time. Very good. If you want to get in touch, uh, you can email howtowin at thetimes.co.uk or WhatsApp 033 We'll do some of your uh, questions next. Uh, we need to bring you some breaking news, Peter. Uh, Keir Starmer has been on Lorraine this morning, on ITV's Lorraine, where they've been talking about you. What about Peter Mandelson telling you you had to lose weight? How rude. <laughs> I hope you've phoned him up and given him into trouble. That's very rude. Well, look, again, I couldn't... And you don't I, win. I couldn't care less. Um, but <laughs> he should come and stand on the touchline when I'm playing football and hear what those, those guys <laughs> say about me. It's so it's nothing? Work. It's but nothing at all? Yeah. There we are. Yeah. I thought he was going to invite you to go join his five-a-side team. That would have been... Well, he did point out to me originally that, you know, unlike me, you know, he plays football and goes to the gym during the week and that perhaps, you know, people in stone glass houses shouldn't throw stones. He didn't say that. Actually, Wes Streeting said that. Wes Streeting did say that. Wes Streeting did say that. Well, maybe, I, think, I think maybe some sort of sports day competition between the two of you is the only way to settle this. Uh, we've had another message on the subject of appearances. Neil has sent us this voice note. Hello. I wonder if you could... Tell me why you think it is that modern day UK politicians feel the need to be seen in hard hats and high vis jackets. That never used to be the case, did it? I mean, you didn't get, I don't know, Edward Heath posing and that kind of thing. Yet the likes of Starmer and, and Sunak seem to be seen in them on a daily basis. Why do they think it is the case that they're more likely to get people to vote for them if they look like they've stepped off a building site? Danny. This idea of politicians going around with a hard hat was pretty much invented by Thea Rogers as a brilliant idea for Maybe. George Osborne. It was the... invented by Mrs Thatcher, actually. <laughs> oh, she, of course, Do you remember? That... She yeah, went but, uh, to but Teesside? The, or... the, of course people had worn it before. I'm just talking about as a as a very concentrated thing because they had the idea that they needed to... to dem- to, to find a picture that said, uh, we have a plan for the economy. And that yeah. was the plan, that that was the picture they came up with building, and they just repeated building, it over building. and over and over again. It's a, it's a brilliant, um, but it's, a brilliant but idea. But crucially, it's because you could do pinstripe suit. Oh, here's our plan for the economy. It involves going to the city, right? But politicians in suits just feels very divorced from the common man. And we know that casual is a nightmare because, you know, <laughs> the hoodies, wellies, jeans, all of that, just, you know, a nightmare. So PPE is like a great excuse to be not in a suit, but nobody can criticise you unless they're criticising that you're wearing your hard hat wrong. Well, yeah, because I've, I've, I've got a friend who works in construction. He gets in touch quite often to point out that politicians it, are wearing their... Ed Miliband went to, the, went to that flood <laughs> and he was criticised for wearing blue Wellington boots. And I wrote an article saying, I basically can never be a leader of the Labour Party, um, mainly because I don't possess any Wellington boots at all. Um, <laughs> you could buy some. Ed, they just Ed, sell Ed, them in Ed, shops. Ed, no, but, 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 but turning up with clean boots is very bad. No, you want no, your dirty bad, boots. Yeah. Every, every photo opportunity needs its unique setting point. But you know, I think I may be wrong about Mrs. Thatcher. How on earth would a hard hat sit on that beautiful no, coiffed hair? I'm looking hair. at pictures of her now. Really? Yeah. And then there's that iconic picture of her in a tank. But the hair, then... the hair. She had that thing because I remember Mistress. she had a pair of headphones on the back of her head because it made her look like Minnie Mouse. I remember that. <laughs> I remember that when she was doing that tea side thing. But I, but it, but it was, it was a focused uh, attempt during the uh, by by George Osborne 
yes, that, it was. that really Fitting made this. The, and it worked brilliantly, and that's why everyone's doing it. Fixing the, the roof while question. the sun is shining. There we are. There we are. We've actually answered a question, Neil. One doesn't ever cease. 0333 if you want to send us a voice note. You can email howtowin at thetimes.co.uk. 